Hello, in this video I'm going to talk about wrist and hand functional anatomy. Uh, so a little bit deeper on some of the anatomy and talking about the relationship between different structures. So the wrist and hand uh, consists of the radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. So many, many different bones. Uh, so altogether, the wrist and hand includes more than 25 different joints and 30 different muscles. Uh, we are not going to discuss all of these, uh, but we are going to touch on some of the more important ones. Uh, there are two small sesamoid bones over the palmar distal end of the first metacarpal. Okay, so the first metacarpal being the, the metacarpal of the thumb. So we're saying that there are two small sesamoid bones on the palmar distal end of the first metacarpal that's right around here. So the purpose of any sesamoid bone is to change the mechanical advantage of the tendon in which they are embedded, uh, which in this case, it's flexor pollicis brevis, abductor pollicis brevis, and adductor pollicis muscles. Okay, the distal radial ulnar joint is formed by the ulnar head in the ulnar notch of the radius. Uh, the radius rotates around the ulna in pronation and supination. So of course, both the proximal and distal radial ulnar joints are important and necessary um, when it comes to pronation supination, the two joints work together. So the radius is rotating back and forth over the ulna, and that is pronation and supination. Uh, if a muscle is involved in pronation or supination, it must insert on the radius. So if a muscle does not attach to the radius, it does not contribute to pronation or supination only a muscle that attaches to the radius has the ability to pull the radius back and forth. If it attaches to the ulna, then it does not cause any pronation or supination because the ulna is not what's moving during those actions. Okay, the intercarpal joints are exactly what they sound like. Those are articulations between each of the eight carpal bones. So between the carpals within each row. Uh, carpals are bound tightly together by interosseous ligaments. So it's like what we see in the bottom right picture there. There's all these little ligaments, very deep, that are helping to attach all of the individual carpal bones to one another. Capsular ligaments also bind the radius to each of the eight carpals in the wrist. Okay, so we have all these little, little teeny eight bones in the wrist. Um, but they're very well anchored by joint capsules and many different ligaments. We have many, many ligaments in the wrist that are attaching carpal to carpal and radius to carpal. Uh, so like if someone has a sprained wrist, that's extremely vague because a sprain could be of any of these many ligaments uh, that we have in the wrist, which often they'll come away with a diagnosis of a sprained wrist and not be able to find out which ligament it is because there are so many um, and it, it usually isn't worth the diagnostic effort to figure out exactly which one is, is injured because the treatment plan would usually be the same. Depends on how severe the injury is and whether there needs to be surgery or, or something more dramatic to, um, to solve the problem. Okay, carpometacarpal joints. Uh, so we have our five carpometacarpal joints. Uh, so we have the, or four, I suppose. Uh, so we have trapezium and the first metacarpal, so that's at the first digit. And then we have trapezium and the second metacarpal up here. Capitate and the third metacarpal. And then hamitate, so hamitate, hamate articulates with the fourth and fifth metacarpals up here. Uh, so all of those joints up here, where we have articulations between the second and fifth digits, those share one large joint capsule. Whereas at the first digit, it has its own separate joint capsule because look how far away it is. So it needs its own. Um, but as I mentioned previously, when we have multiple joints sharing the same joint capsule, that means that normal health and function of the other of all of the joints within that joint capsule depend on the others. So if there was injury at any of these joints, it would be likely or possible to affect the other joints in that same capsule. 
Okay, the carpal tunnel. Now I wanna clarify, um, that's a commonly used term when people are talking about carpal tunnel syndrome. The carpal tunnel is an anatomical structure. Um, carpal tunnel syndrome, we will discuss in a future video, but that's when we have dysfunction at the carpal tunnel. Uh, so the carpal tunnel, the anatomical structure, is a fibro-osseous structure. Um, and so it's made up of the proximal carpals and the transverse carpal ligament. So when we say fibro-osseous structure, what we mean is it's partly fibrous, so that's the transverse carpal ligament part, is the fibrous part, um, and it's osseous, so it's the proximal row of carpals, that's the osseous part, the bones. Uh, so passing through that tunnel, like we see in that uh, top left picture there where we have a cross section where we have the hand and you can see inside of that tunnel, we have the median nerve, flexor pollicis longus tendon, then four tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis and four tendons of flexor digitorum profundus. Okay, so essentially we have nine tendons and the median nerve all passing through there. Uh, so there are a lot of structures passing through that very narrow little uh, tunnel. And so anything that encroaches on that space potentially could impinge the median nerve. And that's where carpal tunnel syndrome comes in. Uh, so carpal tunnel syndrome would be um, entrapment of the median nerve at the location of the carpal tunnel. And then it causes, um, symptoms in the hand, and we'll get to that in a future lecture. Um, but I want to point out that that's different from if we entrap the median nerve at the elbow or at the shoulder, uh, where we might still have the same symptoms in the hand because it's entrapment of the same nerve, um, but it would not be carpal tunnel syndrome unless that entrapment is happening at the location of the carpal tunnel. Okay, the extensor retinaculum is a strong transverse band that anchors the wrist extensor muscles on the posterior distal forearm. So we have different retinaculums in the body. We have a flexor one, we have an extensor one, we have them also in the ankle. And the job, the purpose is to hold down all the tendons that, that pass through that area so that when you hyperextend, it doesn't, cause the muscles to shorten and bowstring is what we would call that. Um, so like in the picture on the top left, that's an example of bowstringing where someone's extensor retinaculum is injured. So when they go up into full extension and maybe even a little bit of hyperextension, what you're seeing there are the tendons of the muscles going out to the hands that are bowstringing, they're popping out because they're not anchored and held down by the extensor retinaculum. Okay, so that is all I have for you in this lecture, and I'll see you soon for the next one.